Thanks everyone for the applause. Nice to be here. Uh, excited to talk about pandas. So uh, thanks, James. Yeah, like James said, I've I've uh, written a couple books over the years. So maybe some of you've read. I have like Illustrated Guide to Python. Um, I've done uh, this machine learning pocket reference. I have an old pandas book that I wrote, uh, learning the pandas library, and then recently I did the second edition of the pandas cookbook. And so the thesis of this talk is that um, I do a lot of training, as uh, was mentioned, and I, I've taught thousands of people pandas over the years, and I've written books on pandas. And so I, I have sort of an inert uh, or innate, um, I guess, draw to it in that, like, before pandas came out, I was, I was doing uh, a, a bunch of uh, business intelligence and had my own Python library. Uh, sort of similar to pandas and pandas uh, sort of did a lot of things better and so i just sort of moved to that and, and sort of haven't looked back um however i i don't think everything is peaches and cream and pandas land and I, um so the the point of this is that i see um a lot of pandas code i see a lot of like people espousing things to do in pandas and I, I don't think all of it is good advice necessarily. So you can take this as maybe a rant or you can take this as like, here are some tips that I can do to make my pandas better. So we'll get started here. Um, so I, and just FYI, like you said, I, I do run a company called Metasnake. I am going to be running a workshop in the summer here for people who have pandas code and basically want to uh, in group environments, basically rework it and discuss with others their pandas code and make it better. So if you're interested in that, um, let me know. Um, that will be taking place this summer, like a week long, uh, couple sessions during the week to do that. Okay, so here, here's our outline here. Um, we're gonna talk about uh, some things I think a lot of people need to do in pandas. And I hope, hope my slides are big enough um, that you can see the font okay there. If they're not, uh, just let me know and I can bump those up a little bit. But uh, we're gonna talk about uh, using the right types. We'll talk about what's called chaining. We'll talk about mutation, which is this uh, thing that a lot of people s tend to be worried with. And we'll talk about application as well. And then we'll, we'll look at some aggregation tips. So what the date, what, um, let me just um, go up here and I'm gonna restart and clear my output here in my notebook. So um, so I'll, I'll just load my libraries here. Um, so I'm using pandas 1.2.3, but most of this will work in anything from like pandas 0 0.0.18. I'm just gonna change some features of uh, Jupyter here and then I'm gonna load my data. So the data set I'm looking at is from fueleconomy.gov. So the US government uh, every year will release like a CSV file of every car make and model in the US and uh, various features about it. So it looks something like this. Um, we've got, it uh, looks like we've got like 41,000 rows here and we've got like 83 columns of like how many barrels of gas it uses, what's the city mileage, what's the highway mileage, um, various features about this. And so basically I'm gonna sort of walk through cleaning up this data and looking at it. So if you look at the columns that we have in here, we got 83 columns. And some of these are less interesting than others, but let's assume that you know you have a new data set or you're working with a data set that's a CSV. I mean, a lot of people, the world sort of lives on CSVs. Um, what, what are some things that you could do to uh, start loading your data? Um, and then working effectively with it in Pandas. So I'm just gonna sort of walk through this from scratch here. So one of the first things to know is that you wanna get your types correct. And, and that's because Pandas does certain things based on types. And uh, if you have your types in the right form, you get to take advantage of some functionality in Pandas that sort of gives you for free. So I'm just gonna pull off some of the columns that might be interesting. Uh, so I've got the city mileage, the combined city and highway, the highway mileage, the number of cylinders, the displacement, the drive, the engine description, the fuel cost, the make, model, transmission type, range, uh, when this was created, and the year. Okay, so if you look at the D types of this, so I'm, I'm sort of assuming that you have some basic knowledge of pandas. And if you don't have some basic knowledge of pandas, sort of apologize, this talk isn't really meant for you. It's assuming that you have some basic knowledge of pandas. But basically what I'm doing is I'm looking at the column types 
And uh, by default, I've got like some integers, some floats, some objects, and that's sort of what I get out of the box when I read a CSV. CSVs are great in that they're human readable. They're bad because they don't have type information in them. Um, let's look at how much data I'm using here. Uh, if I look at the memory usage of this and then I sum that up, I get that I'm using like 19 megs of data in this. So we're just going to go through some operations here to clean up this a little bit. And this is what I would do if I was working as uh, for a consulting gig, taking a new data set, sort of cleaning it up. You go through the different types. And first, I'm going to show looking at integer types. So one thing to know about integer types, the default integer type in Pandas, the int64 type, does not support missing data which might be problematic, especially if you're looking to do machine learning because most machine learning libraries won't run if you have missing data. So let's look at one of those. I'm gonna um, do this, uh, some pandas operations here. I'm gonna se select all of the integer types columns and then I'm going to run this describe. It's gonna give me summary statistics for those. And what I can get here is the count. Count has a specific meaning in pandas. That's the number of non-missing types. So it looks like all of these are non-missing, which by default, it has to be the case because if they were missing, pandas would coerce them to a float type. Um, we got the mean, the standard deviation, and then the, the minimum and maximum values in the quartile. What I want to look at here is the maximum value. And you see that, like, for example, uh, the highway mileage only goes up to 124. So by default, Pandas is using an 8-byte integer to represent that. It looks like I probably don't need an 8-byte integer. So um, now also one thing that I would say is this is one line of code here. I generally wouldn't write it like this. I'd, I prefer to write it in this chain style here where it's like I'm taking these operations and just chaining them together. So what it allows me to do is just sort of walk through, take, here's my data frame. I'm going to pull off these columns. I'm going to select these columns from that. And then I'm going to describe that. So this looks like a recipe when I write it like this. Note that I'm putting parentheses around it, which allows me to escape Python indentation rules and lets me uh, write that pretty easily. Okay, so uh, in, because this is leverage, pandas leverages NumPy, I can look at uh, NumPy to pull off some information about the types there. And if I use an eight, uh, an eight bit integer in NumPy, you see that it has a max value of 127. So I could probably use that eight byte or eight bit integer to use for a highway there. Um, if I look at the 16 uh, bit integer, uh, the, again, this is signed, it goes up to 32,000. And so I can basically do something like this where I say, uh, let's convert using as type these columns to these types. And if we do that and look at uh, the result of that, the description, we see that we don't lose any precision. Um, and um, so uh, in this case, I'm pulling off uh, both integer and int eight columns. There's another way to do that in pandas. I can just say the integer types, pull off all the integer type columns and sort of look at those there. Now, once I've done that, if I look at the sum of the memory usage, we've gone down about a megabyte or so by changing those types. Let's look at a uh, similar, we can do a similar thing for floats. I'll sort of just cruise through the floats because it's somewhat similar here, but I can look at the types that are floats and then uh, sort of take some action on those. Might wanna do a description on some of those like cylinders. Cylinders actually looks like it's not a float type, it looks like it's actually an integer type, but it's probably missing values. So I can use some pandas there to determine that if I use this value counts, that's gonna give me the frequency of the, uh, the counts with the, the values with their frequency. And you can see that there is a missing value here, NAN. So apparently 200 of these cars do not have cylinders. I'm not really a car expert, but I'm assuming a lot of those are electric cars, but there might be some other ones. You can use some pandas code here to query and look at that. And this just lets us look in here. You can see that uh, it looks like there are some various Toyota models where that is missing. Um, and we've got some Nissans and Fords as well as some Subarus. And so you can sort of dive into this and see why you are missing uh, cylinders. It looks like a lot of these are electric cars. Um, so maybe these are all electric, so you might want to take appropriate action, right? And so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to say, um, let's assign cylinders and I'm going to fill any missing values with zero. They have zero cylinders. And then at, at that point, I can convert it to an integer. So I'm using this sign method. If you're not familiar with that, basically it allows you to overwrite or add a new column. And um, I'm gonna also do a similar thing with the displacement column. And 
And so let's just uh, do that and we can sort of check out our results there. And, and, you know, it looks like we're not really losing any fidelity there in our data by doing that. Um, <clears throat> the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to um, uh, look at my memory usage by doing all this. And if after I do that, I, I've saved another, you know, 10% or so of my memory by doing that. Let's look at objects now. Um, so objects are basically string types or mixed types in there. So I'm, here I'm pulling off the columns that might be object types in here. So drive, this one looks pretty categorical. Engine description looks a little bit weird. As you can see, there's a missing value in there. There's these parenthetical things, which are kind of weird. Uh, makes probably categorical models, probably high cardinality categorical transmission. Uh, looks semi-categorical, but it looks like it's got like two variables encoded in one place, like manual and the number of speeds. And then we got this created on that doesn't look categorical at all. It looks like a date. So we'll quickly walk through uh, dealing with these different types and cleaning them up. So um, my go-to when I have an a object type column is to use this value counts here to just sort of get a feel for what's in there. And you can see that um, the drives, it looks like we have some missing values in there. So we might want to look at why, why is the drive missing, right? So it, similarly, we can do some query like this to sort of pull that up and see why we have missing uh, drives in there, which might be problematic. Um, so it looks like a lot of these are electric cars. Um, some of them maybe not, like we've got this Alfa Romeo here. We've got this Bertone X1. Um, and we've got some other, uh, like a V8 Chevy Corvette that's missing a drive. So I'm not quite sure what happened in 1984. It looks like some of these cars are from 1984. If the drive just fell out, what's going on there? Uh, probably talk to a subject matter expert to figure out what, what to do. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to just, if it's missing, I'm going to say, let's fill that in with other, and then let's convert it to a categorical type. And we're also going to convert make to categorical type. And when we do that, we can see that we we actually save quite a bit of data. Um, we start out 19, now we're down to 12. Uh, we can sort of do the same process here with transmission. It looks like transmission, there's various, various types in there. So, uh, and again, this looks like you do have some missing values, but it looks like this is representing two things, uh, manual or automatic and the number of speed. So I probably want to pull these out into two columns. That's what I'm going to do here. You can see that I'm just assigning automatic. It's whether the string contains automatic. And then here I'm using uh, some string manipulation to extract a regular expression that matches a digit. And then if, they're miss if it's missing, I'm going to fill that in with 20. Just say it's got a lot of uh, speeds there and then convert it to an integer. Okay, and then when we do that, we can see that we're down to like 10 megabytes. So almost about half as much memory by doing some simple manipulation. Let's convert the date column there. We have this created on. I'm going to convert that to date here with uh, some code to do that. It gives me an error or a warning. Sometimes Pandas gives warnings, but you can see that we're down to like uh, 7 megs now. So less than half the amount of data by doing that. Um, the reason why it's giving me these warnings is because the data that I passed in the string has this EST in here for the, uh, the time zone. It turns out pandas and Python don't really like EST. However, if I do a little bit more string manipulation here, I replace those with the offsets, EDT and EST, then uh, and I run that again, I don't get the error there, and it just... Uh, sort of works. So at this point, I'm, I'm looking at the value counts for the engine description, which is my uh, my other uh, object type. And you see this one looks pretty freeform. Like there's these weird parentheticals sometimes, FFS. There's like CA model here. There's like spaces in here. I mean, is this like Python code where space is important? Really a little bit disconcerting here. You can see that there's about 500 different entries in here. So. Uh, you might do something like this. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to say, uh, let's just pull off whether this contains the FFS, which is this fuel feedback system. And then otherwise, I'm going to drop uh, that engine description column there. So when we do that, we're now down at like 8 megabytes here for doing that. And at this point, I'm going to sort of call it good. And what I'm going to do is you can see that I sort of built up this operation here. And I'm just going to throw this into a function. So I'm going to make a function called tweak autos. It's going to take my freshly loaded CSV, and then it's going to walk through all these steps. And if you read through this, this looks like a recipe where we're saying, start with this, pull off these columns, 
add these columns or update these columns, convert these columns to these types, and drop these columns down here. Let's just test that make sure that that works and it looks like it does work. So what I like to do is I'd make one of these uh, tweak methods here or tweak functions and then I just put that right at the top of my notebook. So as soon as I load my data, I have the ability to clean it up. I do like to work with the raw data and a lot of people who uh, work with data will tell you to work with raw data, even though it might be slower, use more memory, whatnot. Inevitably, if you're working with data, your boss is going to come to you and ask you to explain something. And if you can't have provenance of where your data came from, it's going to be problematic. Okay, so uh, that, that's sort of getting those types. And you can see that by walking through that process, I sort of can't kill two birds or three birds with one stone. I clean up my data, I understand it a little bit, and I'm saving memory as well. My next section here is about chaining. And chaining is also called flow programming. I've actually, uh, the code I've been using is an example of that. Generally in pandas, most operations in pandas will return a new data frame or a new series, and then we just want to do further operations on that. So highly recommend using this style, and uh, it looks basically what I've been showing you like. Now, sometimes you might need something a little bit more fancy, and uh, I got a hint here, leverage the pipe method on a data frame. So pipe is basically a method that takes a function. So it's a higher order method. If you're familiar with functional programming function or a method that takes a function as input, what it's going to do is call that function on the data frame. And then whatever that returns, the pipe method will return that. So if you can't do something uh, with a chain, consider using pipe to make it into a chain. Um, now, just compare this. Here's my code right here. Compare this with what I normally see in, in the world of, of pandas code. So, I mean, probably if you've worked with pandas here, you've probably seen code that looks something like this. This is what I see when I have students or I'm working with others. I see code that looks like this. And this sort of works, but it's also a mess. I mean, it looks just like a, a big mess of text. This one is very clear what I'm trying to do. Again, it reads like a recipe. This one, not so much. It makes a bunch of intermediate variables. And then when I run it, not only that, it gives me a bunch of these warnings here like this, like uh, trying to uh, setting with copy warning. Um, and so if, you, if you've dealt with pandas, you've probably seen this error and you're probably like, what does this mean? And then you go and read Stack Overflow and you still don't know what it means, but you mess around with your pandas code and you add in some copies or whatnot and eventually it sort of works. However, you note that uh, I did not see that at all right here. So if you follow this chain style, what I'm uh, showing here, you won't ever run into this uh, potential bug or gotcha. Also, your code's gonna be a lot cleaner to use. So. Um, some of you might say like, well, this is a lot more easy to bug because I have all these intermediate variables and it's just easier to work with. Um, I claim that it's not, it actually uses more memory, it's harder to read and your colleagues won't like it and you won't like it when you come back to it. Um, and, and some people say, well, it's easier to debug that other one. Um, so here, here's my take on debugging. I mean, if I need to debug this, what I can do is I can actually just come in here and I can, um, comment these out if I need to. And I can just sort of walk through this whole process here. And then as I'm going through this, uh, look at what it gives me and then uh, uncomment that and keep doing that and sort of walk through the chain. Makes it really easy to understand what's going on just by commenting that out. Another thing that I can do is I can leverage this pipe. So if I want an intermediate variable and generally you don't want the intermediate variables, but you might want to inspect it, Look what I can do. I can leverage this pipe command right here, and I can say, um, let's um, call this git var function. And if you look at git var, it kind of does a hack, but basically it takes the data frame, and I'm going to pass in this string here, and it's going to hack into the global namespace, a variable that has uh, the value of, of the data frame at this point in time. So that's kind of nice. Also, I've got another example of a pipe here. This is just a debug pipe. And what this is doing is just leveraging uh, the display function here to, to print this out. So uh, I can either make a variable or I can print out an intermediate uh, state if I want to. So if I run this, you'll actually see that um, we have two data frames that's printing out. There's the first one and here's the actual output. And if I look down here below, because I've piped in that DF3, variable, this is the intermediate state at that time. So uh, I can very easily using this pipe functionality, 
inspect the intermediate state and see what's going on if I don't want to walk through sort of that commenting uh, uh, step there. Now, a lot of you are saying, well, Matt, you're not using uh, the in place functionality of pandas and pandas has the ability to do things in place. Um, so if you're familiar with pandas, a lot of the methods do have an in place, but it actually doesn't do what you think. And so it, I've got a quote here by Jeff Reback, one of the pandas core developers. This is a comment on a bug that's actually a, a bug request to remove in place. Uh, the comment here is you're missing the point in place rarely does anything uh, in place. You're thinking that you are saving memory, but you're not. So if you look at the implementation under the covers, when it calls in place, it actually goes out and makes a new object and then swaps it in. So if you think you're saving memory by doing in place, you're not. So generally to my clients and students, I recommend that you have like three to 10 X the amount of memory uh, as as what you're working with. And again, if you use uh, that uh, tip that I gave at the start to get the right types, you're gonna save a lot of memory and that shouldn't be a problem. So in, in short, if you mutate, you're not gonna get any performance benefits. You're also not gonna be able to get that chain code. So your code's gonna be that ugly code and you'll have to deal with these sort of setting with copy uh, warning errors and sort of deal with that. So uh, don't recommend that, neither do the Python or the Pandas uh, developers. However, you will see people, and you'll see this in blog posts, you'll see this in whatever, the latest data science recommendation blog post to use in place. Uh, people who are recommending that um, are, are, are misguided and misleading you. Okay, another thing that you'll see a lot of is using apply here. So. Uh, if you're not familiar with apply, uh, what it lets you do is it lets you um, take a, a, a cell, an entry from a column and apply a Python function to that, which might be nice. Um, however, uh, when you do, like for example here, I'm uh, converting everything in here is in miles per gallon in it, and that's sort of US centric. So if you wanted to be like Euro centric, you could do you could do something like this where you say, uh, let's convert it to uh, liters per 100 kilometers. So here's the operation to do that. And this uh, works here. Um, you can just say, take that column and apply this. It's going to give you a new series. But what this is doing is it's uh, working on the individual values and pushing, pulling each individual value out of the underlying uh, memory that is using it, converting it to a Python object, throwing it into this function, and then sticking it back in. So that's actually an expensive uh, operation here. Contrast that with this, which is going to give you the same result, but this is going to be what's called a vectorized or broadcast operation. And basically, it's leveraging modern CPU architectures to do this um, at the C level. So you get, you know, 10, 50, 100 times performance increase by doing this versus using apply. Um, I'll just time these here. And the last time I ran it was like 50 times slower to do apply versus this one. So avoid apply in general if you can. You're, you're basically um, just going to make things a lot slower if you're doing that. Um, now, uh, here I'm doing a, another thing where I'm saying, okay, let's uh, apply, you know, is a column American and uh, and versus doing something like this, which is like a method on a series, is it in? So here's apply, this is going through the, the pan Python function here. This one here is using the pandas functionality, but this is using string operations instead of numeric operation. Now pandas isn't super optimized for string operations. So uh, you, you don't get such a huge benefit. And in some cases you might not get a benefit at all by using string operations here. If you're doing something a little bit more complicated with string operations, uh, then I might recommend or say it's okay to use apply. However, if you're doing something more complicated uh, with numeric operations. Here I've got some examples down here using uh, like NP select and where, which are a little bit complicated, um, but these sort of keep you in uh, those vectorized broadcast operations rather than uh, the slow uh, Python land. And so in here you can see that, yeah, if you're doing something complicated with a string, it's going to be slightly faster, but as soon as you go to numbers, it's going to start being slower because strings aren't super optimized in pandas land. Okay, um, so I'm cruising through here. The last part is just aggregation. So anytime someone asks you, they want, they say, I want to look at this data, buy something, or, or uh, I want to see what's happened over this. That's a hint that you want to look at aggregation. And pandas makes it pretty 
easy to do aggregation. I can say, let's take our autos data set, let's group it by year and let's look at the mean here. And if you do that, this gives you in the index, you see the year there and then every numeric column, you have the mean value. So that's pretty nice. I mean, literally that's one line of code. I've written it, it's four lines of code, but uh, you can start summarizing these things very easily. Now, if I want to pull off uh, the combined mileage and the speeds, I can just pull those out like that. Um, note that, um, I've got two operations here. You might want to be careful about the order of this. This one here, I'm saying pull off combined mileage and speed and then calculate the means. This one here, I'm saying calculate the means and then pull off those columns there. So in this case, this latter case, it's going to calculate the means of all the numeric columns. So depending on how many numeric columns you have, you might pay a penalty for that. So make sure if you're pulling off columns, maybe pull them off before doing aggregations here. Now, one of the nice things I can do is just stick a plot on that once I've done that. What a plot does, it, here again, here is the mean data here, it uh, takes the index and plots that along the X column, and it's going to take each column and plot that as a line. So we can really easily just uh, get a plot and, and compare those uh, yearly averages. If I want to change it from mean to median or quantile, I just change that aggregation in there, and I can quickly see what's going on as, as we to change what what that looks like. Now I can also aggregate by year and country. If I do that, I get what's called a hierarchical index here. And um, it looks something like this where I have two things in my index. And so that's kind of cool. I can also do things where I say, I wanna do multiple aggregations on each column here. So I'm gonna group by year and country, but I'm gonna get the min value, the mean value, and the second to last value. So all these are aggregation functions that take a group and collapse it to a single value. And you get something cool like that. Uh, and this, if you're familiar with pivot tables, this is basically pivot table functionality in Pandas. I mean, literally, uh, I mean, this is one line of code, but I've split it out to make it more readable to do that. Um, and then you can plot these sorts of things if you want to. Now note that if I plot something that has a multi-index, I might get something a little bit scary like that because it's trying to plot the multi-index there. So uh, what I can do, is once you've got something like this with a multi-index, you can do unstack. So what unstack is going to do, it's going to take the innermost index here and plop it up into the columns there. And now we have the year here, and then we have for every numeric column, we have both the US-centric and the other countries. And so we can compare those very easily. And then what I, if, if I want to pull off the city mileage, I can pull that off. So this is what I had right before. So I'm just showing you an example of like debugging this. Then I can pull off the city mileage. It's going to be the values for city. And then I can plot this. And this is a comparison of uh, mileage, uh, city mileage of US versus non-US. And we can easily see what's going on there. Um, if I want to do the rolling average of those, I can stick in a rolling average and get a rolling average very easily as well. So um, if you leverage these uh, aggregations, they're going to make things really easy. And if you, again, write them in this style of this chain style, it lets you sort of debug what's going on and, and sort of walk through that step by step. So these can be super powerful to let you do aggregations very quickly. So. Uh, that's that's my content. In summary, if you use the correct types, you're going to save a lot of space. So, and, and also, if you convert to like dates or strings, you get to leverage uh, additional functionality that Pandas has for pulling out and manipulating dates or manipulating strings. Again, I do highly recommend chaining operations. Um, one of the things that I did with the second edition of this book is I went through every example and basically wrote it as a chain example. It makes your code a lot easier to read, a lot easier to debug. Um, your colleagues are going to like it. You're going to like it when you come back to it. Uh, probably a lot of you have sort of come to that place. If you use pandas where you have some notebook and you can't remember how to get to your state. If you do this chaining, you make a little function that's your tweak function, put it right up there right after your load of your data. You can come back to your notebook the next day, load your data and clean it up in one in two steps and you're good to go. Don't mutate. There's no point if you're doing that you're sort of like shooting yourself in the foot. It's not giving you any value, even though you think it is. Again, apply is slow for math. I don't recommend it for math. I generally find some other way to do it. I'm sort of, it's okay for strings because strings aren't really heavily optimized in, in pandas. And then aggregations are super powerful. So learn to leverage those. Um, 
Okay, that's that's my point here uh, or my presentation. Thanks for listening. If you want to follow me, I'm on Twitter, Dunder M. Harrison. Again, I will be doing a workshop this summer. So if you're interested in basically taking your existing code and applying what we've talked about, cleaning it up, making it more readable, uh, reach out to me. Uh, that will be running later this summer.